Hello, I'm Liam, and I'm reading Mark Allen Gunnell's Unfinished Business as part of Lex's Christmas story thon So, let's get on with it. The first thing I saw when I returned from the hospital was Mark's book sitting on the sofa where he'd left it. He'd been curled up at the far end, feet tucked beneath him, engrossed in the novel while I watched some sitcom on television when the chest pains had started. During the 15 minute drive to ER I had worried, not excessively so, he and I were only in our mid 40s, in reasonably good shape, mostly healthy and exercised regularly. Even with my husband slumped in the passenger seat, grimacing and complaining about the increasing pain I had found myself unable to consider that it could be anything terribly serious, certainly not a heart attack. That was simply unthinkable, something that happened to other people. People who are overweight, people who are lazy, people who clogged their arteries with fat and grease. No, I fully expected the doctors to diagnose him with a bad case of heartburn or gas and recommend Malox or Alka-Seltzer. But then it was a heart attack after all, and quite a serious one. The doctors had worked on him for hours, but in the end Patrick had died on the operating table. Patrick died. Two words I still have trouble reconciling. They didn't seem to fit together, polar opposite concepts. Many white coats with grey expressions had talked at me for a while using words that were familiar but foreign. Myocardial infarction, bypass, coronary thrombosis, all Greek to me. All that really penetrated the fog that shrouded my mind were those two words repeatedly on a sadistic loop. Patrick died. Patrick died. Patrick died. There'd been papers to sign, so many papers. I don't think I'd had to scroll my name so many times since Patrick and I bought the house seven years ago. They allowed me to view the body before taking it down to the morgue, but I didn't linger. There was no clinging to his cold hand telling him I loved him and asking him to wait for me on the other side like you might see in movies. I could tell instantly that the empty vessel under the sheet wasn't my husband. He was what had once filled the vessel, in essence now spilled out somewhere. It was nearly 4am before I staggered up the front steps and let myself into the house. I felt numbed, still in shock no doubt, but the pain just lay underneath, close to the surface, and I knew that soon it would break through and swallow me whole. I figured I needed to find Patrick's insurance policy. I didn't know exactly how all this worked, but I thought I might have to get the information to the mortuary to cover the funeral expenses. As I thought the word funeral, I felt strength grow out of me, and I stumbled across the room and collapsed onto the sofa. For the next half hour I gave in to the grief, sobs shuddering their way out of me. My face slicked with tears and snot, my mind rebelling at the idea Patrick was gone, that I'd never again hear his laugh or feel the touch or smell of his distinctive scent as we spooned in bed. Once the tears tapered, I reached over and picked up the book my husband had been reading, some kind of murder and mystery. I wasn't really much of a fiction reader, but I remember Patrick saying this was the last in a popular series he'd been following for years. Opening the hardcover to where he had stuck the bookmark, I saw he had been only two chaps away from the end. For some reason this made me cry again. I saw Patrick's ghost for the first time three days later, the night after his funeral. He'd been lying in bed for over an hour, exhausted but unable to sleep. The bed felt so empty, a large vacant landscape in which I was lost. The lack of his presence next to me was a void that I felt like a physical hunger, and it would not allow me to rest. Taking the pillow and blanket, I decided to go to the living room and stretch out on the sofa, hoping a change of scenery would make it possible to drift off. Even a few broken hours of sleep would be a blessing, a blissful escape. It was as I came down the hall into the living room that I saw him. Moonlight shone brightly through the window and behind the sofa. And I clearly saw Patrick curled up at the far end, feet tucked beneath him, his book open on his lap. I gasped and fumbled for the light switch by the front door, but in the glare of the overhead bulb, Patrick simply disappeared. I turned off the light again to see if he returned, but he did not. I made my way to the sofa and settled in, but I found it no easier to sleep in the living room. As I lay wide awake, I tried to convince myself that I hadn't really seen him, that my eyes had merely been playing tricks on me. I might have been able to do so had I not smelled his scent lingering in the air. Over the next month I saw him several more times, always the same, curled up on the sofa reading a book. He would, be he would be visible for a moment, then vanish, leaving behind only his scent. I would try talking to him in that moment, but he never looked up from the phantom pages. In life, Patrick would often be so unaware of what was going on around him while reading that I'd have to call his name three or four times to get his attention. 
but now there was nothing I could do to make him acknowledge my presence. I began to feel like the ghost. I didn't tell anyone. The only thing that I was crazy or perhaps so consumed by grief that I was hallucinating. I considered the possibility myself. In the end, I turned to the internet and researched ghosts and hauntings. From the information I gathered, it seemed that what I was experiencing was residual haunting. A spirit stuck in a loop, repeating often mundane activities over and over with no interaction with the living. A few articles suggested that residual hauntings were often the result of spirits with unfinished business, and they would only be able to move on once some type of resolution was reached. The night I read about residual hauntings, I waited until after midnight, then went into the guest bedroom that Patrick had used as a library, and retrieved the murder mystery he had been reading when he died. I tucked it away on a shelf the night after the funeral. As I stepped into the living room, I saw him again. By the time I settled on the sofa, he had disappeared. I opened the novel to where the bookmark held my husband's place. After clearing my throat, I began to read the final two chapters out loud to the quiet room. The killer was revealed and justice was meted out. When I was done, I closed the book and returned it to the shelf. I never saw Patrick again that night.